Hello and welcome to Living With. I am delighted today to introduce you to David Bishop, who is the president and CEO and founder of the Sleep Equity Project based in Chicago, Illinois. David is a person also living with sleep apnea and he is passionate about closing the gap in sleep health in underserved communities through the Sleep Equity Project and also through his work as an advocate in the sleep community and at congressional level. In this episode, we discuss the challenges around addressing sleep inequity, why it exists, and what needs to be done to ensure everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic background or ethnicity, that they can have access to faster diagnosis and treatment for their sleep disorder. By way of disclaimer, um, we did have some internet issues in this recording, so thank you for your patience, and let's welcome David. David Bishop, thank you for joining me this morning. Um, it's always such a pleasure to um, have a conversation with you. I know we've been colleagues for a few years now, and I'm just really excited to be able to have a few more minutes with you to share with our community your expertise and your journey. So welcome to Living With. Thank you very much, Claire. I appreciate the invitation to uh, to talk. Absolutely. So let's just um, get started, David. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you are, because that's super relevant to this conversation, uh, and then also your journey in sleep health? Yes. So uh, I was diagnosed with sleep apnea in 2006. And uh, prior to that, or, or first, I should say, uh, I'm in uh, Oak Park, Illinois, which is just right outside of Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, close to Chicago, really nice uh, community, lots of resources. So I live here with my wife and two children. And, um, you know, I was completely unaware of uh, sleep apnea for many, many years. And my wife, you know, was had a front row seat to really see, you know, how I was struggling with, with various uh, aspects of sleep but we really didn't have the language to be able to describe it um, so that a, a physician could really get involved. And so I struggled along for quite a long time. And I think I even normalized being so tired, you know, way back in college. Uh, I was in ROT, Army ROTC and uh, that required a lot of effort, you know, working late nights and being out uh, on the weekends uh, doing uh, drill, so I, I really normal fatigue very early on. So, you know, when I graduated, I, I really didn't think much about, you know, being tired, just had to power through it. Um, and we took a family trip uh, together, my, my family. And, um, you know, the lights went out and my uh, sister had a machine in her room you know we we're going around checking to see the outlets to see you know what blew the circuits and i, I saw this machine and i had a lot of questions and uh, i asked my sister about the machine and her experience and she told me she has sleep apnea and uh, described her symptoms and my wife could have uh, knocked me over the head because there were a lot of symptoms that i had been struggling with for quite a long time um, so after that, I was, uh, went and, uh, got connected to a sleep physician and got tested for sleep apnea and was diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. Um, so that was, you know, my introduction to sleep. It was not on my radar. We, my sister and I really had not talked about that previously. Uh, so that was, that was my first introduction and I felt, you know, very alone. Uh, even though my sister was diagnosed, um, didn't quite know who to turn to, uh, but now we had an answer for severe sleep fat. Yeah, that's so, what was the timeline there then, David, between how, what you would kind of describe as sort of the beginning of your symptoms to actually a diagnosis? Well, even as a, as a teenager, I can remember uh, being extremely tired and, um, you know, sometimes I would sleep on my stomach and I, you know, really felt like I was suffocating. Uh, and I had that experience a number of times, you know, throughout the years prior to being diagnosed. Um, one time when uh, as an um, officer in the Army National Guard, 
you know, we're away, you know, for a two week drill and I'm in my officer's quarters and, and trying to sleep. And I can remember not being able to breathe and felt like I was suffocating. Uh, and, I, you know, I was trying to sleep and, and it was, you know, really difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can remember various times in hindsight um, where it felt like my airway was closing. And again, it's in hindsight now that I know as much as I know from, from reading about it and just, you know, getting educated. Um, so yeah, I can, I can remember symptoms even as a young child, uh, wow. as I think back. That's incredible. So, um, what was the, um, prescription? What was the therapeutic journey once you'd got a diagnosis? So, uh, back in 2006, uh, it was pretty straightforward. The, the doctor immediately, uh, prescribed a CPAP continuous positive airway pressure. Um, and, you know, they gave me a packet of information, uh, and I was, uh, really, um, not, you know, I didn't really read up on it as much as I should, but, mm -hmm. uh, I was prescribed the CPAP and, um, I followed the advice of the doctor and I was fortunate to be able to adjust, uh, to using the machine. Uh, and, and, it was interesting because the response that I had was, it was kind of a split response. Um, so I was still tired for months and months and months. And, and when you talk about fatigue, and I know you understand this, you know, it was brain fog. It was being able to fall asleep at the breakfast table, at meetings, um, at parties. You know, I would be the one to sleep at a party. Uh, my wife never really understood, like, what is going on? So, you know, that really extreme fatigue and, and like, whole body kind of experience still continued. Um, but one thing that I recognized immediately was that cognitively, uh, it was as if I turned, my hearing was turned on. It was like I was partially deaf, it felt like to me. That was my experience, the way I describe it. And what I came to learn is that cognitively I was very impaired um, and I was in a, you know, I had attributed it to being just exhausted and, you know, working uh, full time in a very rigorous environment. And also uh, I was in graduate school uh, prior to that or, or during my, my time uh, while I was working full time. So I was always very engaged and, you know, young children. So, you know, my difficulty concentrating, my difficulty understanding what people were saying to me, I felt like it was just part of being tired. I mean, you just dealt with it. But once I got treated with CPAP, that started to lessen. And it really felt like I could hear people clearly. I could understand people more clearly. And it was, it was a really strange kind of um, process. And, and then the extreme fatigue, it probably took about four or five months for that to really show substantial improvement. Uh, and, you know, I, the doctor had, uh, or their office did check in with me. Um, and now I understand it's a kind of a, they have that three month window to check in with you uh, and that's it. And you see them a year later. Uh, yeah. So, you know, in hindsight, you know, the system is really not set up to support people who are struggling. And luckily, I just kind of blindly followed and, you know, was going to wait to see what happened. And fortunately, I did, I did respond to treatment. What's your, um, what's your day job now, David? What do you do now? So right now, I, uh, well, for the last 30 years, I've been employed with the uh, Cook County Adult Probation Department here in, in Illinois. Uh, and um, for 22 of those years, I worked in our mental health unit. Uh, so I got promoted uh, while I was an officer in that unit. So I spent eight years as an officer, uh, adult probation officer, and then uh, I've been a program manager for the last uh, 22 years. Um, so that, that experience really, I have a, a license in clinical social work. Uh, so that experience was really, uh, very valuable to me in terms of working with people in need. Uh, so we, we work with people who have severe and chronic mental illnesses. Uh, and so I really enjoyed that. It was a passion of mine and I could see people were struggling and they needed that support. Uh, 
So it was a really very demanding uh, job. So I know that we intersected through your work with the Sleep Equity Project. Can you tell us a little bit about how that was um, kind of conceived? What, what what was the need that you identified to bring you to that point of actually setting up your own organization? Yes, well, I I had been interested for quite a long time in you know my own health, and I felt like I really wanted to read a lot about uh, health conditions and, and sleep apnea. And I, I felt like um, there were probably some connections to it. And I, I soon found in reading, you know, a lot of research, which I enjoy doing, I soon found that, that there are numerous chronic health conditions that are have a high prevalence with sleep apnea. And um, that was very much of interest to me to understand my own health condition. And through that, uh, reading various research articles, I found that, you know, there are millions of people who are undiagnosed with sleep disorders in general, and in specific sleep apnea. And, you know, that, that really started to pique my interest um, as someone who was, you know, working for so long with people with severe and chronic mental illnesses, which is, you know, unrelenting, you know, when somebody is, is suffering uh, from a mental illness. Uh, and, and, and most of the people we worked with had a co-occurring substance use disorder. Um, so, you know, those, those things are really uh, very difficult. Um, so I was really interested in the cognitive aspect of sleep apnea. And then that kind of branched out to other uh, chronic health conditions. Uh, so that really motivated me to, you know, talk to my family, to talk to my you know, friends and neighbors and eventually that, you know, moved to me really getting interested in, in uh, advocacy work. Uh, so I sought an opportunity to join an advocacy, a national advocacy organization focused on sleep disorders. And you really get immersed in the sleep medicine uh, environment. And one of the things that really helped me through the experience is, is learning about various other sleep disorders like hypersomnia, idiopathic hypersomnia, and narcolepsy. And um, talk to different uh, patients within other patient advocacy organizations, and also uh, lots of uh, conversations with physicians, uh, sleep physicians. And you know, from the outset, I was really interested in working with people who are underserved. So you know, minorities, uh, children, uh, older adults are underserved with regards to being aware that they have a sleep disorder, being aware that there are connections to chronic health conditions. And, you know, going through those different uh, advocacy organizations, I was able to, you know, move into roles where, into leadership roles. And, you know, we had, you know, really good discussions about programming and how we can really impact, you know, the community. But, I really didn't see any robust programming around underserved people with regards to sleep disorders. And so that's where the idea for the Sleep Equity Project came uh, to me. And it took quite a while. There's, there's really robust research uh, on uh, sleep health disparities. Uh, so I was really enamored. I was really, I was really excited to read a lot of that information and understand you know, the various uh, approaches that are being uh, worked on to to intervene, uh, to work with people who are underserved. So uh, that's what really got me interested in in the forming the Sleep Equity Project. I know that a lot of your work is very kind of local, as it were, which is really interesting to me in the Chicago area, because, of course, we live in such a digital area. But I was so impressed, David, as how you're sort of really trying to meet the needs of your local community. When you talk about the under, undeserved population, what what are those elements um, in your kind of neck of the woods, as it were, that are really kind of the biggest roadblocks, the biggest um, obstacles for people to get a diagnosis of a sleep disorder? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I originally conceived that this would be a national approach, and uh, I really did start to reach out to organizations nationally. And one of the things that I found is that a lot of national health organizations, a lot of organizations that are focused on chronic 
uh, illnesses, they really don't have sleep as part of their programming. It seems like, you know, we're in the sleep world. You know, we understand all of these connections. We are really excited to talk to people about it. But once we exit the sleep world, it kind of falls upon deaf ears. And, you know, it really uh, mirrors that society really has not given sleep the due that it is really deserves in terms of how it contributes to our health, overall health. And so that was my experience in trying to reach out nationally to, to organizations. And so I decided to shift and focus locally. And I actually found the exact same uh, experience where organizations were really struggling with the idea that sleep would be a viable program area for them. I was trying to focus on organizations that were uh, working in areas where sleep disorders have a high prevalence with chronic illnesses and, you know, still ran into a number of barriers. And so, you know, I had to really take a step back and try to figure out how to strategize to, to focus on organizations that really have more of a neighborhood impact. And so uh, that, you know, a lot of the barriers that people have in, in neighborhoods, you know, run across various, um, a lot of barriers that people have in the, at the neighborhood level has to do with really looking at the social determinants of health. Uh, so you have uh, neighborhoods that have a, a high density where the, the buildings are very close together. There's a lot of noise and light pollution. Uh, there may be a crime that is interfering with people's ability to, to sleep. And, and those are some things that people in other communities may take for, take, uh, for granted. And so uh, some of the other things that I saw is that, you know, people in various neighborhoods that are underserved may not have that access that, you know, we kind of maybe take for granted uh, to sleep medicine. And, you know, that's something, you know, when you look at where sleep clinics are located, when you look at where sleep clinics are located and hospitals are located, um, it tends to be in areas that are, are more socioeconomically uh, advantaged, uh, as well as, as other resources. You talk about those food deserts, you talk about uh, financial deserts, and you talk about uh, sleep deserts. Uh, which was a, a term that was coined um, by Harayer Atarian, who's a sleep physician at Northwestern and, and colleagues. And that really talks about the lack of access that some people have to sleep medicine. And it really has a tie-in with the primary care physician uh, because primary care physicians really have a lot on their plate. They really have a lot to do to, to accomplish in a very short period of time. And sleep is something that is really not on their radar as much as it should be. And so when you look at, you know, when somebody presents to their primary care physician and they're they're talking about complaints of their of their sleep, you know, they may be more likely to be prescribed a, a sleep or to help them. Uh, so it's it's really a multifaceted issue that cuts across a variety of levels. Uh, that I think are are presenting a lot of barriers to people who are underserved. Yeah, it's hugely complex, isn't it? Um, yes. I think that's a very helpful term, sleep deserts. Um, and apart from, I mean, you, you just mentioned some key elements there that are really related to um, uh, the underserved population, like light pollution, and really built up areas. Are there any others that we we kind of take, as you say, we totally take it for granted that my neighborhood is quiet at night and I can have like, you know, darkness rather than like light pollution. Are there other um, aspects there, David, that um, really impact people's sleep in the undeserved communities? Yes, I think there are a number of others that are, are really very important to talk about. You know, there's the there's a socioeconomic and environmental impact that uh, really uh, goes on to impact people's quality sleep. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about, you know, wages and someone who maybe is not being paid a living wage and they have to work a second job, you know, right. that is tremendously disruptive to their ability to get what sleep medicine says that someone should get for, for quality sleep. 
Uh, so shift work, uh, uh, low wages, and also uh, racial discrimination is something that really impacts uh, the stress level of individuals and really affects their ability to get good quality sleep. Right. So there's there's really a whole range of, of uh, factors that cut across a variety of different areas. Um, and it's really difficult to really delve into these things because some of them are very large issues. You know, think about the light pollution and the noise pollution in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, that really is very complex to, to tackle. But, um, you know, there's some really great research that's looking at various interventions to, to help people with a number of these different barriers. Uh, so that that is of great interest to me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think where I can be most valuable as a a relatively new nonprofit, I think the Sleep Equity Program Project, I think the Sleep Equity Project can really uh, have more impact on neighborhoods and individuals. Mm -hmm. So can you say a little bit more about what the Sleep Equity Project does for those um, individuals or um, communities where you've identified these huge barriers and they are so complex, um, but how, how does your organization actually help those people? Yes, yeah, so what we're looking at getting involved with is uh, programs that can really have more of an impact to neighborhoods, to individuals, and to families. And so, you know, we're working on a project to develop a sleep education program for community health educators. And in my research, I found that there really is no curriculum out there for community health educators. And I've introduced this concept to various organizations, and I'm in the process of working to, one, develop a curriculum in, in collaboration with sleep medicine, and um, also to work on capacity building with community health educators to you know, really add this as a really valuable tool to their uh, array of things that they take out into the community. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, going out to health fairs, which is obviously very time intensive. It takes a lot of time. So, you know, this weekend I have a health fair that I'm going to, and it's uh, sponsored by a major organization, the Chicago Urban League here in Chicago. Um, and they expect 400 people. And so, you know, that grassroots effort of really talking yeah. to people face to face and you know, provided them education about sleep disorders. And this effort actually is in collaboration with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. They have a, a grant, a three-year grant that they received uh, that focuses on sleep apnea awareness uh, for the community. So they have various community partners all across the country. So I'm partnering with the American Academy of Sleep Medicine to spread awareness and education about sleep apnea. So awesome. these are a number of things that I'm really interested in, and I have, you know, many other things that I'd like to do. Uh, but you know, you you know, uh, you know that you know these programs take time to develop. Mm -hmm. They take time to find funding, and one of the things that I'm finding is that there is not a great deal of funding outside of sleep medicine for programming in regards to sleep. Uh, so, you know, there are various organizations. I know the American Academy of Sleep Medicine has a foundation, and they provide really, really uh, valuable grants to various uh, organizations. Uh, I believe the Hypersomnia Foundation uh, was a recipient of one of those grants recently. Uh, so it's, you know, the funding... There needs to be more work on developing more substantial funding for programs and organizations that are focused on uh, helping people in the community with sleep disorders. Yeah, it's a good point. Our, our funding at HF um, is research focused more so than something, as you would say, like so important at grassroots level. And David, when you speak, it sounds like you're, you're heading out there to these fairs on your own. Do you have a team at all? Do you need volunteers? How, how can we put the word out? The great work that you're doing so that you're more supported yeah that that you know really would be what i'm in most need of is people okay. who are willing to you know take up the uh, challenge of 
you know, spreading awareness about sleep disorders, because that's one one of the really, uh, you, you know, when you look at it from a socio-ecological perspective, you know, really helping people change their beliefs and attitudes about sleep is really very impactful. Having people partner with me to do that is really very helpful. Uh, so yes, anybody who is interested in in, in helping you know, work on underserved populations uh, here in Chicago, um, they can reach me at my website, sleepequityproject.org. Awesome. We'll certainly put that in the notes as well. Um, is there anything else, like looking forward to the through to 2024, 2025, what, what are your kind of, what's the mission, the sort of first steps as it works? So I know you're fairly new as an organization and you, as you said, doing so much on the ground, pretty independently, making huge headway. Um, what what can we kind of hope to see from the Sleep Equity Project in the next year or so? So some of the projects that I'm working on for the future are really trying to, you know, dig a lot deeper on um, various groups that are impacted by sleep disorders. Uh, so, you know, one area that I'm really interested in is uh, people with Down syndrome who are showing a very high prevalence with sleep apnea. Um, that, you know, really is something, you know, when I, you know, when I think about, you know, underserved populations, you know, you talk about people with disabilities, uh, that, that is an area where, you know, uh, there's a, a tremendous need there. And there are a number of different programs across the country that have been started to help people with Down syndrome in regard to sleep apnea. But I don't believe there's one here in Chicago, so I'm really interested, wow. and uh, I'm in preliminary talks with a sleep physician uh, here in Chicago to try to really, you know, make some headway uh, wow. on that that uh, area. And you know, some of the other things I'm really interested in is, you know, working on uh, really looking at what is the state of minority sleep health. Uh, here mm -hmm. in Chicago and even nationally, like, you know, what, what are the issues? What are the bigger barriers that need, you know, maybe that multidisciplinary cooperation among various positions and community agencies, you know, public health and government yeah. to really address this, you know, from a, a larger uh, scale. So I'm really very interested in yeah. that. And then, you know, looking at other sleep disorders, um, I have sleep apnea, but I'm very interested in learning more. And that's why I reached out to you, you know, learning more about various other sleep disorders. And, and you know, there's actually a lot of overlap, you know, yeah. you may have you know more than one sleep disorder. And that's, you know, something we touched on before in our mm -hmm. previous conversations, yeah. you know, what, you know, there are a number of people treated for sleep apnea and yeah. that, that excessive sleepiness does not go away. And then they go on to find out that they have hypersomnia in addition right. to sleep apnea. Right. So, it's, you know, that I'm yeah. really interested. Yeah, I think that's where we overlapped in the beginning, wasn't it? Just to really sort of look at these silos of sleep disorders. And I think when you've sort of got a diagnosis of one, you kind of like stop looking or even expect there to be another. But you're right. Um, you know, we see lots of overlap. Um, and also, as you rightly pointed out, David, that in all sorts of other disease spaces. Um, again, once you've got one diagnosis, sometimes um, everything else is attributed to that. And actually it, it there is another disorder, quite often a sleep disorder. Um, I think your work is incredible and hats off to you for taking on such a huge challenge, but so, so important, so vital. Um, and you, You've educated us um, today and it's been such a pleasure working alongside you. And I hope we can continue to support your efforts, David. So thank you for all you do and for the time you've taken to explain the work of Sleep Equity Project and the importance of that in underserved communities. And of course, giving um, a lot more information on sleep apnea and how that can intersect with um, our space, Hypersomnia Foundation with IH and of course, narcolepsy. So thank you for taking the time, David. It's always such a pleasure. Yes, thank you very much, Claire. I appreciate the time and the opportunity to talk to your audience about uh, the Sleep Equity Project. Right, and we'll be sure to put um, your details, contact details on your website in the notes. So uh, to our audience, please head over to the Sleep Equity Project and find out more and see how you can lean in and support this great work. Thank you. <laughs>